Identity fraud, brainwashing, betrayal. Here are seven times games lied to us and we loved it. Games are massive liars. They force us to spend hours doing quests, following causes we think are just, then hit us with twists that ruin everything we've just done. Instead of just watching some hapless protagonist get everything wrong, we're the fools. And the strangest thing about all this is that it's brilliant. Games tell us the best kind of lies, the sort of warm, encouraging fibs your mum would whisper to keep you happy. Yes, Matthew, of course you can have Manhunt for Christmas. And no, the other children aren't laughing at your tusk. These are elegant mistruths designed to surprise, please and amaze. Cleverer than the most effective movie plot twists. Games can be twistier than a pretzel made of other smaller pretzels and movies simply can't compete with the scale of the deception. So what if Tyler Durden and the other one were actually the same person? Come back when you've made us accidentally spend 10 hours fighting the wobbling manifestations of our own repressed urges. One word of caution before we head on though, this video will feature spoilers for all of the games listed in the description below and Fight Club I suppose but it's a bit late for that so pop back once you've played them all or just read the plot synopses on Wikipedia. Here are seven times games lied to us and we loved it. Not only is Knights of the Old Republic one of the best Star Wars games ever made, it also has one of the best plot twists. You start off as a random Republic grunt pulled into a mission to rescue very important Jedi, Basta La Shan. But as the plot gently unravels, you discover you're actually Darth Revan, AWOL Dark Lord of the Sith, and you've been given a fresh take on life thanks to some morally dubious Jedi brainwashing. The Jedi Council captured Revan and erased the Dark Lord's mind programming in a new identity. This is one of the all-time best lies in games because it really makes you question who you are. If, like me, you play the entire game as a simpering Jedi goody two-shoes, it's a fascinating moment of introspection. Do you switch things up and have a go at being evil? Or do you keep being lovely to everyone just to impress Bastila? It's like a second puberty without all the sprouting hair. Whatever you decide, the game accommodates your choices brilliantly. You can carry on being wonderfully nice, or you can murder your goodie bags teammates. You only really need two anyway. And then there's a second twist, which further complicates things when Bastila, the person who spent the entire game telling you to be careful, falls to the dark side herself. You can attempt to redeem her, or just go full evil, leading to some awesomely dark moments. You can even force Zalbar to murder his best and only friend Mission in order to honour his Wookiee life debt to you. The only thing more evil is modding Knights of the Old Republic so you can play as a Jedi from the start, ruining the most perfectly plotted game Bioware has ever made. Well, I hope you're proud of yourself, Darth Impetuous, Dark Lord of the I Want Everything Now. I know what you're thinking, and I am sorry, but we were never getting through a feature about lying without mentioning Portal. The meme that shall not be named is so ubiquitous there's even a TV tropes page named after it. So let's just embrace it and move on. Portal, of course, is far cleverer than the weary regurgitation of this trope suggests. It's about far more than hypothetical gatto. The entire game is one complex and brilliant lie stuffed with smaller functional lies, like a taducken of half-truths smeared in deception gravy. You realise the scale of the lie when you can see what's actually behind the pristine surfaces of the Aperture Science Enrichment Centre. But perhaps the best thing is the way that GLaDOS and the game itself keeps lying to you, just as you keep running through the maze of tests, because really, there's nothing else you can do. And when GLaDOS starts to joke about only pretending to kill you, it actually makes you doubt yourself. We are pleased that you made it through the final challenge where we pretended we were going to murder you. And the game is powerful enough to make you care about a box, an actual box, and then feel terrible when you have to destroy it. You euthanized your faithful companionship more quickly than any test subject on record. Congratulations. The whole thing is one wonderful, manipulative enigma. And that's before you realise that the lie you thought was a lie isn't even a lie at all. Hang around for the credits and you'll see a companion cube and some personality spheres enjoying a Schwarzwalder Kirschtorte in a gloomy basement. But then the cake was real, you just didn't get to eat it, doesn't quite have the same ring. Next up we have Silent Hill 2, which is the twist equivalent of learning those headaches you've been having as a result of you wearing your hat too tight. I knew it. You too! Everything here is your own fault. 
As you reach the end of this gruelling survival horror, you realise that all the monsters you've been fighting are the physical manifestations of protagonist James's repressed desires and guilt. And why is he guilty? Because he secretly murdered his terminally ill wife. She died because she was sick? No. I killed her. Note how I said protagonist and not hero. This one works so well because it undermines everything you've done, which is exactly what a horror game should do. There's no triumph here. You're not defeating some cosmic force or unholy presence. You're merely stuffing your own feral and preposterous instincts back inside their box. Or as I like to call it, just being British. And in keeping with the theme of the twist, the game changes depending on how you play. Spend too much time with Maria, for example, the woman in game who reminds you of a more vivacious version of your real wife, you know, the wife you murdered, and the finale will change to reflect this. I don't look like a uh, ghost, do I? Replaying Silent Hill unlocks different endings, which is sort of a brilliant double lie. First you think you're fighting monsters, then you think you're fighting your own horny meat dreams, and then it turns out it was just a dog pulling some levers. Perhaps it's a thoughtful comment on the relativity of truth, or perhaps I just wanted to show you the dog ending. Oh, who's a good boy? We can't stay angry at you, even if you did kill all those people. Oh, yeah, you are. The Call of Duty series has become synonymous with breathless, bombastic set pieces, but when Modern Warfare was released in 2007, it was a different beast. The fourth Call of Duty game had dynamism and surprises, and nothing hit quite as hard as seeing one of the protagonists, Sergeant Jackson, wiped out by a nuclear blast. This was one of my first experiences of a game following through on a character death. When Sergeant Jackson starts dragging his irradiated body around, I assumed we'd find a health pack and everything would be fine, but it wasn't fine. It was the opposite of fine. This plays with the idea that when we take control of a character, we usually have the opportunity to change the outcome of events. If this was a cutscene, death might have felt inevitable. But by giving us power, then taking it away, Sergeant Jackson's death feels different. It's a vicious and effective way of shifting your focus, and every level that follows feels like an act of revenge for a part of you that's been lost. Few things in COD have had the emotional wallop of this moment, and that's perhaps because we've sat here ever since, waiting for something equally powerful to happen. And we'll agree here not to talk about Modern Warfare 2's Space Nuke. This one isn't so much a lie as the game pretending it didn't hear the question when you ask, what the hell am I supposed to be doing? In Dark Souls, there's a strong chance that the main quest is one giant, terrible ruse. In the standard ending, you defeat Lord Gwyn and light the final bonfire, sacrificing your soul to prolong the Age of Fire. And that might be the worst thing you could possibly have done. It's a fascinating one because like everything in Dark Souls, it's never explicit. If you follow the obvious path of the game, you'll meet King Seeker Frampt and probably do as you're told because he's an intimidating primordial serpent with horrible teeth. But there is another way. After you defeat the Four Kings, you'll bump into another primordial serpent named Darkstalker Karth, provided that you haven't yet placed the Lord Vessel on the Firelink Altar. Follow his advice and you'll get another ending, one which puts a different perspective on everything you do in the game. He encourages you not to listen to Frampt and not to relight the final bonfire. The suggestion then is that by following Frampt's instructions, you're merely perpetuating the doomed state the world is currently in. Follow Darkstalker Karth's advice, however, and you'll break the cycle and usher in the Age of Dark. You become the Dark Lord, ruling in a new world without fire. Is that a better ending? Sort of? Maybe? Probably not. The ambiguity is deliberate, and the truth is probably that neither ending is good in the traditional sense of the word. Still, you know, new game plus, right? There have been few lies in games bigger or more brilliantly plotted than the idea that you play as Snake in Metal Gear Solid 2. Now, I could have put any Metal Gear Solid game here because this is very much Codge's thing, and each clever lie gives us a fresh opportunity to analyse the hobby we love. But the brassy, swaggering bombast of MGS2's falsehood is just incredible. There's enough going on here for a much longer video by a much smarter presenter, but this lie tells us about how our expectations affect how we consume games. And on a deeper level, this superficial lie about who you play informs the plot of the game which is built around misinformation in a post-truth world. Right, but he can't be THE Solid Snake. For some people, the second Metal Gear Solid game is too avant-garde for its own good, but it's hard to criticise a game that uses such lofty concepts alongside ninjas and vampires.
Now I do realise not everyone loves this line. Many people, myself included, played large portions of MGS2 wondering when we could stop controlling the nudie cartwheeling milk toast and start playing a snake again, like we were supposed to. But that's exactly why it's brilliant. It's so completely, unthinkably outrageous, we'll never see anything like it again. Metal Gear Solid 5 came close, but that is a spoiler for another day. Snake! And finally, fully deserving of its number one spot, we've got the twist in Bioshock. Give yourself a cookie if you knew this one was coming. I know it's predictable to include this one, especially after I've alluded to the portal cake thing in an earlier entry, but it's simply too good to ignore. I don't love this lie because of the scale of it. Bioshock, despite the setting, is quite a personal story, but because of how it savagely dismantles your sense of agency. It's brilliant because it makes you feel powerless. That sounds like an odd thing to say, but games differ from other mediums because they let us take control. But then along comes Bioshock, telling us that we were just doing as we were told to do all along. Stand, would you kindly? And while the twist in the previous entry on Metal Gear Solid 2 works because it fooled us into thinking we were going to play a game as someone else, the twist in Bioshock has a clean, almost surgical precision. You've not been playing the game, the game has been playing you. There are two problems with a twist this good. Firstly, it can only work once, and even the act of taking back control in the later stages of the game slightly undermines its effectiveness. Secondly, it makes us expect more twists. Ken Levine could make a mobile game about a happy-go-lucky otter selling lemonade to old ladies, and we'd still expect an existential swerve in the final act. Like Portal's Cake, it's become such a part of the gaming vernacular that we've forgotten how clever it is. But few games make me want to go back and play them all over again for the first time, quite like Bioshock. Now, would you kindly play us out, Silent Hill Dog, like the game? Buy a shock, would you kindly? <laughs> Let us know in the comments below what your favourite big twist in games is. And please subscribe to Logitech G for more weekly shows and give us a thumbs up if you think Silent Hill Dog is a very good boy.